Obviously, transparency is key and recognising that that can, can be challenging. For small businesses, I think it's important to say that it's okay to start small in recognition of their different impacts and, and influence. Hello and welcome. I'm Elizabeth Formosa, the founder of Fashion Equipped and devourer of all things fashion, business and mindset. In this podcast, I'm speaking with thought leaders, change makers, and entrepreneurs about the business side of fashion and everything in between. Fashion Business Mindset is your front row seat to real stories from designers, brands, entrepreneurs, makers, and mentors. We'll discuss how to launch and grow a fashion business and give you insider access to the future of fashion. So let's do this together and ensure that you're equipped to make the fashion business your business. Welcome back to Fashion Business Mindset. Now today is episode 99 of the podcast. We're so close to that milestone 100th episode. Thank you so much for being on the journey with me so far. Now in the lead up to our 100th episode, I would love for you to share your feedback. Who would you like our 100th episode guest to be? If you head to our website, fashionequipped.com.au, you can click the send voicemail button to leave me a message. Or of course, you can head to our Fashion Equipped Instagram or Fashion Business Mindset Instagram to send me a DM. I can't wait to hear from you. Now, my guest today is Sandra Caponi, the co-founder of Good On You. Good On You is a leading source for sustainability ratings in the fashion and beauty industries. Since 2015, Sandra has led the Good On You team to rate over 6,000 brands for their impact. And Good On You partners with global retailers like Westfield and Farfetch to empower millions of consumers to buy better. With years of experience in corporate social responsibility, Sandra has been long concerned about supply chain issues in big business. Sandra founded Good On You because she sees huge potential in using consumer power to drive industry change. I learned so much during this dynamic conversation with Sandra as we discussed one of the most important topics at the forefront of a sustainable future in fashion. And no doubt you will too. So let's dive in. Sandra, welcome to the Fashion Business Mindset Podcast. Thanks, Elizabeth. So good to be here and and to catch up with you. I know. We've done it. We're here. (laughs) <laughs> now, before we dive into catching up on Good On You, I'd love for you to share with our audience a little bit about yourself and your background before launching Good On You. Before Good On You, gosh, it seems like a, a lifetime ago now. I know. Um, I, well, I'm Sandra, as you mentioned, one of the co-founders um, from Melbourne, uh, or I should say we're under a country. It's, it's um, Reconciliation Week here in, in Australia, so a special shout out to my traditional owners and First Nations people. Um, I, I think I've I've always had a bit of a bent for social justice. I've I've thought about in the past where did that come from? Um, probably has something to do with my upbringing, my migrant upbringing. I'm sure you can guess from my surname that um, my heritage is Italian. Both my parents actually were Italian migrants, um, and I think that gave me an understanding of. Uh, you know, not everyone came came from the same place. Some people uh, were less privileged, uh, had to struggle in in life, and and had some had to work hard, harder than others. Actually, Mum's first job when when she arrived here at age fourteen was in a in a knitting factory just down the road from where I live today. Wow. Um, so I had, I had, yeah, I think a, a lot of these kind of influences that just give, gave me a sense for the world and, and my place in it. But I, I spent a long, long time in my early career trying to figure out what on earth to do. I kept my studies really broad. I, I studied business and arts 
I loved economics and politics and languages. Uh, and then of all industries, I fell into banking. <laughs> Um, uh, but I have to admit, I, I had a great sort of early corporate career. I learned a lot about business and supply chains. And uh, and in particular, I, I think I learned about the power of money and what shifting capital could do, uh, both good and bad. Um, and it's where I, I had this idea of sort of, or this first idea of using money for good. Uh, and eventually I, yeah, still in banking, I, I worked in corporate social responsibility in departments like Indigenous finance and sustainability strategy, which, like I said, was great great for some time, but eventually I did get frustrated and tired with how slow the progress was and how, uh, I mean, you know, we're talking over 10 years ago now and and sustainability and, and CSR was still sort of seen as a nice to have thing on the side. It wasn't considered core business. And yeah. I just got a bit tired of trying to convince people that there was money in this and value in this, that yes, there was a responsibility and we needed to hurry up and do something. Um, but also, uh, yeah, there, there was a commercial opportunity that nobody seemed to be looking at. Um, so I started searching for something bigger and more powerful and, and that led me to the next big chapter that was good on you. Amazing. Um, thanks for sharing your background. I can relate to the migrant upbringing, the same, mm -hmm. my dad, Maltese, mum, Scottish. So lots of groundedness, I think in an upbringing like that. And I love that that's kind of led you on this connect connection kind of path, connection to people and purpose. So how was Good On You born? Like what inspired you to go down this path? You could have gone down lots of different paths after banking and having, you know, that sound kind of foundation in finance, it can lead you right across all industries. Um, why Good On You and, and who has been your partner in crime? Yeah, it's de it's definitely a partner in crime is how, how I would put it. I, I had the fortune of meeting mine, Gordon Renouf, at that time, as I said, that I was becoming a little bit jaded and searching for something bigger. And Gordon had already been working on Good On You. He he had this idea of empowering consumer choices and it was just something that really I resonated with. It tapped into my ideas of using money for good and this notion of using people power, consumer demand, a, a commercial incentive to actually drive industry change. Yeah. I also, you know, identified as, as a conscious shopper myself and um, there was this whole movement of people at the time that were also putting their hands up wanting to buy from better brands. And so together, yeah, we, we decided to join forces and develop um, th this solution, which was all about create creating really robust, world-leading brand rating system that would help shoppers wherever they are, know the impact of their choices and buy better. Amazing. So for those who have not used the Good On You platform or even heard of it before, how would you articulate exactly what it does from a high level perspective? It's a brand rating system that uh, looks at a brand's sustainability practices across three key issues of people, planet and animals. Um, we chose those three themes because uh, we know that they're important to consumers and they're really important issues for brands or companies to be considering to tackle the, the biggest sustainability issues that we're all facing. In the beginning, we, we started as, as a direct-to-consumer app. Um, you know, it's 2015, it was the time of launching apps and we had something like over 10,000 downloads in less than 10 days. So we knew we were onto something. We were really tapping into this idea of people wanting to know what their choices meant and wanting to do something better and support brands doing good. And, and we evolved over time to uh, become an online directory of brands. We've now got over 6,000 uh, fashion brand ratings on the app and on our website that people can search and, and get ideas and recommendations for better options but more and more uh, recently we, we've actually been having our our biggest 
uh, focused and our biggest impact through our partnerships with with industry with retailers um we you know we're not the only ones trying to help consumers uh find better brands large multi-brand retailers and e-commerce platforms and other you know shopping centers are also trying to engage consumers on these issues we've um i guess evolved to be more of a b2b platform where we're um, still rating brands on these issues, but serving that up to partners, retail partners through our own API and B2B dashboard. dashboard. Yeah, um, amazing. I love it. I love the power of the B2B model. Let's let's talk about that because you're helping companies like Farfetch, Westfield, Microsoft, some big names in there, yeah. And you're helping them with their brand portfolios and to promote the better ones to their customers. So can you talk us through how good on use independent ratings and e-commerce solutions work and what have the results been for organisations like that? Good on you is not the only one that's trying to reach consumers with this type of information. Yeah. Um, retailers, businesses all over the world are also recognising that consumers care that there's a demand, there's a market out there that needs addressing. But uh, the problem is it's it's quite hard for companies to first define what does sustainability of a brand or a product look like, um, how do they measure that, collect the information, and then how do they present it to consumers in a way that's engaging and easy to understand. You mentioned Farfetch. They were sort of researching um, themselves wanting to create a way to talk to consumers about sustainability and a way to tag or, or label certain products and brands that they stopped. And they ended up discovering good on you that we had this methodology that they could use to efficiently um, and also credibly, given that sort of independence, uh, rate their portfolio, assess their portfolio, and then surface that information to their customers um, in a way that made sense. And, you know, it's it's started in e-commerce, but there's also other applications. We're now working more and more with commercial real estate companies that also have a portfolio of brands. And again, they're looking to us to assess their portfolio against our methodology, against our sustainability criteria, uh, yeah. so they can benchmark and measure where, where their brands are sitting and um, support them to improve over time and then engage their, their uh, on-the-ground customers as well with, with the relevant information. And that these types of businesses are uh, seeing commercial results. There, it, it does often sit within their sustainability strategies, but sustainability teams also need uh, to have a business case and some of our partners are seeing higher sales, higher customer loyalty, uh, even higher average order values um, for associated with brands and products that they stock that have certain sustainability attributes. I saw that Farfetch, for example, grew conscious sales 1.8 times faster with Good On yeah. You. So they've got these amazing, ambitious sustainability goals, and we can see that Good On You is driving a lot of that information and, and helping them with key decision-making. Yeah, that's right, Farfetch, um, one of the largest e-commerce platforms, luxury e-commerce platforms in the world, headquartered in London. They had this idea of, um, as I said, build, building a like a sustainability a collection or range on their on their form. Uh, they called it positively conscious, mm. um, and uh, and they tipped into our technology. We rated over one thousand of their partner brands. Now it would be in the two two to three thousands, um, mm. and they used um, our our ratings to launch this positively conscious collection, which in the, in the first year grew. Uh, almost two times faster than the rest of their marketplace, um, proving that that there was a customer need, that their customers were looking for brands with these particular attributes. Um, and sure, they cared about many other things as well. They cared about um, the style and the look and the, the reputation of the brand and price in some cases. But more and more, they were also looking to see the sustainability credentials and Good On You ratings allowed Farfetch to um, serve that up to their customers in an efficient way, in, a, in an independent way, in a way that Farfetch trusted and their end customer could trust. 
and we've now been working with them ever since. So it's, it's coming up to five years, I think, our partnership with, with Farfetch. Yeah, really powerful and some compelling results there. I'd love to dive into how the ratings work, where the data comes from, because Good On You brings together the world's leading and most reliable sources of information on sustainability, analysing more than 500 data points across 100 key issues. So I'd love to share more about that with our audience so they know exactly, you know, how how the ratings have been put in place and, yeah, where the information comes from. Well, many of us in fashion know that uh, sustainability issues are complex and that also there are already hundreds of different standards and certifications that address these issues or that are looking at, at measuring and uh, providing an, an indicator of performance against these issues. So from the beginning, we we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. We we wanted to um, look at what were the leading indicators and, and standards of, of best practice and make sense of that for consumers, bring it all into one place. We also, from the beginning, had this principle of, of transparency. It really is core to our ratings approach. Um, and it's not just because it's easier to to collect uh, publicly disclosed information, but it's based on this belief that if a brand is transparent about what they're doing, then that drives accountability and ownership on their part. Um, But also because we're all about empowering consumer choices and we believe consumers have the right to know. So if brands aren't talking about what they're doing, then how are shoppers supposed to make more informed choices? So, yeah, I guess these two things were um, the foundation of of our ratings process and the collection of all of this information. We, over the years, developed a team that would look at all of these standards, indicators of best practice and, and refine or develop a methodology that says what are the most material issues against those three pillars of people, planet and animals, And what are the indicators of impact that a brand is either talking about themselves or a third party has audited and and certified on their behalf? Um, So for Planet, for instance, we're looking at resource, water, chemical use. Um, We're looking at a brand's climate change impacts, um, what circularity practices they have in place, how they're reducing waste, how they're tackling biodiversity, the list goes on. Same with people, it's obviously about labour rights issues and whether brands are engaging their suppliers, tracing impacts across the supply chain, really working to ensure payment of a living wage. And and then the third pillar being animal welfare and the sourcing of of animal materials and how uh, harm to animals is reduced across supply chains. So you can see why there are so many data points. Um, yeah, yeah. Like I said, you know, the issues are complex. We're trying to be really comprehensive and robust in our approach, uh, but not starting from a blank page, looking at what, what's out there, what, what brands are disclosing, what's best practice, what are the standards and certifications that are leading and how do we summarise that all in a, a rating uh, out of five, from one to five for a brand and, and, and against each of those three pillars. So just to clarify, at a fundamental level, if a brand is not fully transparent, if they're not sharing this information publicly, they can't be rated. Exactly, yeah. And if they're not saying anything, how are they deemed? They're rated one out of five. So we don't wait for brands to approach us and and wait to be rated. Again, we're prioritising what consumers need and what they're looking for so we can assess a brand whether or not we're uh, we're in touch with them, and for those brands that are that are silent on these key issues, we score them a, a one out of five, and we present that back to consumers to say they're not they're not disclosing any any information on these issues, so we can't tell you whether they're doing enough, and and so we suggest you avoid this brand until they start communicating more. Is it mainly consumer driven, or are the likes of you know Farfetch, for example, also asking you? to go out and rate certain brands? 
it, it's definitely both and you know arguably it's um they're both ways of prioritizing what consumers are looking for farfetch yeah. is also sourcing and stocking brands that they think connect with their customer base so we started by actively rating brands on the high street or the mainstream brands that we all know um, but also really searching those brands that are often lesser known but are, are doing some really cool really leading things on these issues so we have a real mixed bag of also requests from from consumers we have people contacting us every day wanting to rate a particular brand in their work in their wardrobe or brands that contact us themselves that want to want to be rated, want to get that uh, visibility across our platform and across platforms like, like Farfetch. Um, and then we have our partners, Farfetch Microsoft, you mentioned earlier, uh, the Westfield uh, group out of Paris, and we're, we're constantly rating their, their portfolios and keeping that that database up to date for our our consumers and our partners. That's why we quickly reached six thousand fashion brands in our in our database. Um, there's thousands more that we would love to rate more quickly, and we're constantly, I guess, evolving our tech to try and collect and assess information more efficiently. Yeah. So a brand could be rated at any given time. What would you share with brands tuning in who perhaps are at the beginning of their journey of sharing this type of information around their responsible business journey publicly, Sandra? Obviously, transparency is key and and recognising that that can, can be challenging. For small businesses, I think it's important to... Uh, say that it's okay to start small. You know, where we have a different uh, methodology for small and large brands in recognition of their different impacts and, and influence. So for small brands, we're really looking at what are the initiatives that, that they're taking on today to address um, people, planet, animal topics and uh, what plans do they have for the future and, and maybe even being open about some challenges that they've had and what they're doing to remediate those. So the more transparency, the better, the more engagement with their own customers on these issues, the better, even when it's not leading, not succeeding all the time, because sustainability is, is hard. It's complex, like I said, but saying something, uh, encouraging that that dialogue with brand's own customers is is uh, what I would say is really important. Mm. Um, for large businesses, um, the expectation is is higher. We're seeing, you know, uh, maybe a few years ago, there were a lot of brand, large businesses that were scoring one out of five, weren't really quite silent on sustainability. But most large brands now have some sort of reporting disclosure on sustainability. Many have annual sustainability reports or at least a portion of their website where they're talking about their initiatives, which is a great improvement. It's great progress. Uh, unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of target setting and big sort of claims and programs without much reporting on how those targets and programs and initiatives are going. Mm -hmm. And And as far as large business, big business goes, that's that's really not good enough. That's not best practice today. You know, it's it's easy to set a carbon neutral target, but but what's the point if you're not actually working towards it, not not demonstrating progress against that? So that I guess is one big area of encouragement. Something we're we're seeing quite a bit in in our ratings. What's holding brands big brands behind? I, w- I would also say that you know for for businesses of any size. It really is about supplier relationships and how companies, businesses of any size are working with their suppliers all the way down down the chain. Um, that's that's where the impact happens. It's it's not just, you know, when we're distributing and promoting our, our brands and our products, it's in in the making of the clothes, the sourcing of the materials, that's where the sustainability impact happens. And it's through supply relationships and empowering workers all the way down the chain that we're encouraging businesses and we've, we're seeing the leading businesses are actually prioritizing that in, in addressing their impacts. As you said, it's complex and it's the whole end-to-end journey. I've had amazing brands like Alk and Basic and Country Road and Outland Denim on the podcast and 
I've loved seeing their transparency reports going from strength to strength. I mean, the amount of detail that I had Marnie Godding recently from Alkin, just looking at their transparency report, it is a phenomenal piece of work. And I think for anyone tuning in, thinking about where do I even start? You know, if you are a smaller brand at the beginning of the journey, I think starting by looking at what leading brands in our industry are doing and just gain some insights there. And as you said, Sandra, a really important message is to say something to get started, but also be authentic and real about the goals. As you said, saying by, you know, 20 50, <laughs> I'm going to do A, B, C, and D. It's not really for now. It's what are we achieving in the short term? What's realistic for our stage of business and showing that we're actually moving forward as businesses as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Looking at other examples, recognizing we are we are in a community, you know, fashion, the fashion industry here in Australia and, and globally is a community. There are lots of people that have made a commitment, individuals within large organisations that are have, have made a real commitment to changing how their businesses works, facing into these issues. And I, I think, you know, more and more sharing these ideas, these innovations, looking at what peers, even competitors are, are doing is, is a good place to start. Our our directory that's that rates, as I said, 6,000 brands, it's, it's free, it's available for everyone to go and see um, we're trying to get better at also publishing what our methodology is. So, so sometimes brands are using that as a bit of a guide for what are the what are the issues they should be considering. What are high impact issues versus those that don't really have much of a dent on their sustainability performance. Sharing information is really key, um, and looking at the the tools that that are available. Uh, we we worked with Farfetch actually. Uh, a couple of years ago to develop the Good Measures platform. It's an extension of, of Good On You very much for brands uh, that's uh, trying to give them full visibility of their Good On You rating. What are some of the uh, most important issues that they could focus on to improve their rating and, and so their their impacts um, and guiding them on, on different ways to be more transparent around that. I guess that's, that's also in, in recognition that it's not that easy, but you know, if we we sort of support one another and, and tap into all the expertise that's being created in, in this space, then we can support brands to be more open and, and ultimately give consumers information they're looking for. So the tools are there, the support is there for those who want to embark on this journey or take their sustainability um, journey to the next level. There's lots of support, right? There is, there yeah. is. And the benefit of being on your platform, I'm hearing, well, eyes on your brand from a consumer perspective, and then also the likes of whether it is Farfetch or Westfield or any other organisation out there, utilising this tool to to onboard brands into their portfolio. That's pretty powerful. Yeah, it's shining a spotlight on those brands that are leading the way and um, you know, our ratings are, are intentionally out of five because sustainability is not black and white. You're not either su sustainable or not. E everyone is sort of on a spectrum, on a journey and um, highlighting those brands that are doing good on specific issues or overall that are really tackling things is something that should be celebrated. Progress should be celebrated yeah. Our rating three out of five, we've, we've labelled it's a start. Again, just uh, sort of putting a positive spin on this and showing the importance of recognising progress. And if ultimately we're on Good On You and other platforms celebrating those brands that have found a way to tackle these issues and connecting them to consumers, then we're tapping into some pretty powerful market forces that can help accelerate this this change that we all know is so important. Yeah, I love that. I love the celebrating progress because often we talk about the downside of the industry, but we are making, you know, we are taking steps forward to improve. I mean, you've been at the front line of this for all these years. If you were to assess, you know, how that progress has been tracking, there's progress there. Would you say that we need to start speeding that up or, you know, from your observation, you're like, this is actually good. You know, I can see brands moving along quite swiftly. What's your take on it? 
It's definitely a mixed bag. Like like I said, when we first started, there were lots of brands that were pretty silent on some really important issues. But now most big businesses um, in fashion have sustainability reports, recognise that consumers care, starting to engage. Uh, at the same time, though, we're seeing, you know, some of the issues around waste, around carbon emissions, around treatment of workers in in various countries that you know those issues that we were all worried about uh, 10 years ago are still there and some of them are even worse so sadly the progress that's being made is is not enough it's not happening quickly enough it's not all doom and gloom and i think it's important not to just focus on on the doom and gloom but but recognise that there's many, many active players here. There's consumers that have a role to play. There's brands that have a role to play. There's regulation that has a role to play. Mm -hmm. And it's about continuing to create the the systems and the dialogue that incentivise each of these players to play their part. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think you've nailed it the way that you've um, shared that. And again, you're at the front line of this. So is there any other message that you would like to share with brands or businesses that are tuning in that you think would, you know, offer them some assistance to improve in this space, whether it is around transparency, their sustainable business journey, circularity, any any of the above? I think there's at times a conversation that's not helpful, um, which is saying that, you know, consumers say they care about these issues but ultimately just want cheap clothes um in a you know in a really accessible convenient way and that is part of of the story many consumers uh, especially in today's economic environment need to prioritize buying um, less expensive clothes locally whatever it might be but that is completely undermining uh, something that is still very real for consumers and that is wanting to feel like they're not undermining their values, um, wanting to feel good about their purchases, wanting to support brands that uh, will be around for the long run and will create an environment and a community that is sustained for the long run. That need, that desire, that want, that demand from consumers mm. uh, is is still there in in the context of of a very dynamic and at times challenging environment of of economics of wanting to pr- prioritize price and and what have you. So, I would encourage brands not to dismiss the consumer sentiment, even though it, you know it does change over time and. It fluctuates, mm. uh, but not to discount it because we continue to see through good on you the responsiveness, the commercial responsiveness of, of shoppers prioritising one brand over another because they otherwise fairly similar, but one is doing better on these issues. Uh, we can see continue to see our, our part commercial partners making more money from brands that have um, being tagged with a positive good on you rating. And so if we keep making these excuses or keep just having that, I guess, more negative view that at the end of the day, shoppers don't really care, well, they, I think these brands in the long run will uh, will fall behind. Won't, 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 hopefully they won't exist in, you know, in a decade or so, but short term they will start to fall behind and, and I don't want to see the industry make that mistake. Mm, such an important message. You've got to stay the course, right? There's going to be twists and turns of the economic landscape, but you've got to stay the course as a business. As you said, it's um, it's a non-negotiable, really. This is the future of fashion, retail, and many other industries. Now, Sandra, we know that it takes a village to build a business. No one does this amazing transformative work on their own. So I'd love to dive behind the scenes of Good On You. Love for you to share where you guys are based, who's on the team, and yeah, what the organisation looks like. It certainly does take a village. There's um, <laughs> now almost 30 of us in, in the Good On You team, would you wow. believe? from our humble beginnings. Gordon uh, is based in Sydney, so we were originally headquartered in Sydney, 
Uh, like, I'm, like I said, though, I'm, I'm born and bred in Melbourne, still am in Melbourne. And so from the very beginning, we've we've been a remote team, even before COVID days that, that forced us all into online work. Um, we built a team really from the ground up with this way of working being fully distributed. And um, even though we fell into it, we've really embraced it because we, we see a lot of benefits in being able to just recruit the best person for the job, no matter where they are. Mm-hmm. Also just in being able to be in many different places all around the world without having to establish, um, off, you know, offices and all the costs that comes with that. Obviously we have the benefit of being a tech company and, and able to operate without a lot of that physical high cost infrastructure, but it's, it's definitely worked in our favor. We've been able to have partnerships with retailers in the US and, and UK, um, all from our, our humble beginnings in Australia. And I don't think we would have been able to do that as effectively without having superstar people join good on you from, from all over the world. We've got our ratings team is really core to what we do. It's it's our um, our core IP, the the technology that that powers all of our um, solutions on our platforms and on our retail partner platforms, mm. and that that is essentially a team of sustainability experts. Our head of ratings, Christian Hardiman, is is Aussie but based in the UK and previously from the Carbon Disclosure Project, CDP, so has that expertise in, in climate reporting and questionnaires, um, but he, he's built out a, a team of, of sustainability experts over the years. Obviously, tech and product is another big stream and function uh, at Good On You. And, and again, we have members in, in Australia and, and globally who help us turn that sustainability expertise into systems and tools that our consumers and businesses can use. And then we have a big focus on, on relationships and partnerships and um, having a group of people that work closely with, with me to uh, collaborate with, with other businesses that are looking to engage consumers. And, yeah, like I said, I think relationships are relationships that we have with with brands and retailers and, and industry stakeholders is a really big important focus for the team as, as well as that that expertise in in sustainability and tech. Mm, congratulations, team Thank of you. 30, and it yeah. sounds like it's super dynamic. I'd love for you to share a little bit more about your role with our audience. What's the day in, a day in the life of your role like? It's varied mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and, it, and it changes a lot. I, I know many people who have started a business resonate with that roller coaster type type image of, of how things are up and down, sideways, all, all over the place. Although as, as we've grown, I, th- I think my role has been less around sort of jumping in and firefighting to building out our, our partnerships function really in our sales, marketing, um, and content, but really building out what is what is our business model? How do we create value for our customers who are these retail partners? And how do we continue to serve them the tech and the tools to enable them to uh, engage consumers? So um, Gordon would generally oversee our product and tech development and I uh, generally oversee our our partnerships function, our sales and marketing function that is about, yeah, distributing our, our tools and tech to to retailers and engaging consumers through those channels. Yeah, certainly a, a dynamic and demanding role. So just to lead on from that, Sandra, I'd love to know what support systems you have in place that help you when it comes to mindset and well-being that help you to achieve this, all of the wonderful things you're doing and and operate at an optimal level? Yeah, I think it's got to do with the remote first mentality. Closely tied to that is a a respect for people and really valuing flexibility. I've been watching with interest what's happened since the end of the pandemic and lots of businesses mandating that people go back into the office and 
hearing a lot of grumblings and, and resentment around that. And I think at Good On You, how, how we're different is that we really trust our people to do the work and you know, we're, we're never in, in an office peering over one another's shoulders. We're never monitoring people's hours. We're just looking at their role and focused on whether they've got what they need to get the job done. And again, we, you know, we have the benefit of being tech driven and, and, and so that works better for us and it might for other types of organizations. But I think that trust in people and that flexibility that we give to our people is something that drives a lot of engagement and productivity and maybe almost ironically like collaboration. Like we're Mm. we're all really, um, yeah, passionate about that. And it's something that for me personally, I've always really valued. I mean, I'm often taking late night calls, talking to our partners in, in the UK and the US, but I'm able to balance that with, prioritizing other things during the day for for me that's you know doing a lot of yoga and pilates and prioritizing my my health my physical and my mental health and my family i think that um i wouldn't be as motivated as engaged if i was sort of forced in in a physical workspace or, or an environment that wouldn't allow that um flexibility i love what you've shared i haven't had this reply because i asked this question to all of my guests and I think it's the first time someone's shared the power of the flexibility of really, you know, whether it's remote or a hybrid kind of workplace model, there is a power in that because you can carve out more you time, or us time um, to prioritize, as you said, you know, physical, mental health, you know, whether it is a mid-morning run rather than getting up at 5am before you got to drive right. into the office and you're already exhausted before you get to your desk and all of those things. That flexibility is really powerful. And I think, you know, you've really shared quite articulately how Good On You has set up this amazing ecosystem of 30 people without having to be in and, and an amazing organisation without having to be in an office looking over everybody's, you know, each other's shoulders. So it's certainly a different way of working. And I've noticed that too. I've, I've noticed that there's so many people who've really embraced this new way of working, but then there's also organisations that are trying to entice their workers back into the, you know, the physical workplace. And I guess, you know, it has to work for the business, but I love that, you know, I guess that power in the flexibility and how you can really carve out more time. It's more, a more productive as well, better use of time. It's not, it's not for everyone. It's not for every business, as I said, and it's not for every individual. It just, it, it really works for, for me. And um, it's become a, a real part of our culture yeah. that we, we celebrate. I, I mean, sometimes I do wish that I could bring everyone together in a room and, you know, celebrate a, a milestone or just the end of the year and, see see people in in the flesh and and there's yeah that's something I miss um and and there are of course some challenges around how do we coordinate a meeting that everyone can actually join or even if it is online just with all the time zone differences yeah um but I think that for us the the benefits outweigh those those challenges and it's yeah it's really nice having a culture where people are kind of sharing where in the world are you today and <laughs> Um, not hiding what what they're doing and where they're working from, but actually, you know, bring, bringing it to to the table and inspire we, we inspire one another of of how we work and live. Mm, and I think that's the important part: working together, inspiring each other, no matter where where you are in the world. Yeah. Absolutely love that. Now, Sandra, since we've got um, you know brands, retailers, all sorts of businesses in our organizer in our industry that are tuning in. From a commercial partnership perspective, is there anyone in the Australian industry that you have your sights set on that you would love to be working with at Good On You? I'd love to work with so many more Australian businesses. It's been an interesting dynamic for us in that a lot of our early uh, interest and our partners were overseas. That that wasn't intentional. And I think I'm still trying to put my finger on what that's about, because I think the, the Australian consumer is really engaged on these issues. But maybe in Europe, the sentiment was just a little bit 
further ahead. Mm -hmm. Um, And equally, a lot of businesses in in the UK and in Europe maybe had bigger sustainability budgets and uh, or bigger innovation or marketing budgets that were able to play around with tech solutions like ours. Um, And I know, you know, the, the Aussie fashion and retail industries smaller and has has struggled over the last years like lots of industries here locally Um, but I'd love to work with any especially multi-brand fashion business we're actually just about to expand into a new category this is hot off the press but we're about to launch um, into beauty ratings as well so any online or physical retailer that stocks many brands that um, wants to promote better rated brands, better performing brands to their consumers. I'd love to talk to them. I'd love to look at how we can tap into to our ratings, to our tech, to to help them engage with with Aussie shoppers that I know are, are looking for these types of brands and products. Yeah, amazing. There's an open invitation, everyone. Reach out to Sandra. Congratulations on beauty. What a perfect additional category. I mean, that's yeah. that's phenomenal. Yeah, definitely years in the making. It was always part of the vision. I feel like we've been talking about it for years and years and years. And certainly consumers, the the early users of the Good On You app and uh, more and more the partners that we work with have been asking for it. So so again, we're, we're following that consumer demand and uh, we got a bit of investment to help us fast track that, that development. And um, we're just about to finish rating our first beauty brands and we'll be launching those with um, with Westfield, one of our retail partners, uh, in the next month or so. So nice. stay tuned. So exciting. And you heard it here first, guys. That's exciting too. <laughs> Always love to break some news <laughs> here on the pod. Now, Sandra, thank you so much for sharing all of that. Now, final question to you, because you've been at the forefront of the fashion space for for quite a few years now. So in closing, we'd love to know what your ideal vision is for the future of fashion. Not surprisingly, it's all about transparency, where brands and businesses of all shapes and sizes are really open about their impacts, about how they're running their their businesses behind the scenes. They have a good understanding of uh, how their practices impact on people, planet and animals, and they're talking about it with their customers. And consumers have access to all the information they need to be able to choose brands that match their values, that are tackling the issues that they care about. We always talk at Good On You about, you know, wouldn't wouldn't it be so cool if you could check the sustainability credentials of a product just as easily as you could check its price? Uh, and I guess that's that's the vision that we're working towards, just full transparency so that all the decision makers can play their part in a better future. Mm, love it. And I'm sure that's a vision we will achieve at some point in time. Sandra, congratulations to you, to Gordon, your entire team on the powerful purpose-driven work that you all do. We're so lucky to be able to have that phone in our hands and have that app and be able to get access to all of this amazing information. And I think from a commercial perspective, a really powerful tool for brands and businesses out there that want to work with you on that level as well. So thank you for being so generous with your time and sharing all of the information around Good On You and your journey in the industry with us today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for giving me the time and the space to talk about what I love, what I do. And and yeah, it's been it's been really nice to talk to you. So thanks. Thank you so much for listening to the Fashion Business Mindset Podcast. We'd love to keep connected. You can find us on Instagram and Facebook at Fashion Equipped. And if you'd like to find out more about our Start Your Fashion Business program and your mentor collective, head to our website, fashionequipped.com.au. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share this podcast with others. Hit subscribe, leave us a rating and review. Let's do this together. Let's make the fashion business your business. This is a Guide Your Light Network production, creating podcasts with purpose.